So all these paintings are from 2021. Um, and I'm hoping sometime next year there'll be an exhibition where all these paintings will come together um, and be shown in one place. Hello and welcome to episode two of the QT Cast, the official podcast for the Mark S. Bonham Center's Queer and Trans Research Lab at the University of Toronto. My name is Elliot, and I'll be your host. In today's episode, I sit down with Abdi Osman in his studio at Witchwood Barnes. Abdi shows me his current works in progress, and we chat about his recent project, Shadowboxing, as well as what inspires him as an artist, respectability politics, gay cruising, and more. Abdi is one of the community leadership residents at the QTRL and a Somali-Canadian multidisciplinary artist whose work focuses on questions of Black masculinity as it intersects with Muslim and queer identities. If you missed episode one of the QT cast, now might be a good time to head back and check out our introduction to the lab, where you meet everyone, learn about their roles, and get the lowdown on the lab and its explorations. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and remember, you can reach us at qtcast21 at gmail.com, and you can find us on social at qtcast underscore. Without further ado, let's check in with Abdi. I'm working on this project, which is a film project. Um, doc- basically, I would consider it to be sort of like a documentary cool. um, film, which um, focuses on one individual who's a friend of mine. I've known him for quite a few years now. Um, and he's been, well, he's originally from Barbados, mm. but came here as a, a young person. So pretty much grew up here um, in the 70s. I've actually had several conversations with him. Mm. And so what happens is, and then I got interested in his idea of kind of like spatial, um, queer spatiality in Toronto, where black queer people used to hang out and and queer people in general. Mm -hmm. But I'm focusing on mostly the black queer people and where they used to hang out. And so I'm going going through, well, he's taking me through his own experiences of those spaces. Cool. What's his name? um, Rooney. Rooney. Green, yeah. Was he on your, the recent conference? That yeah, you cool, cool. He was one of the panelists for awesome. Shadowboxing. Hi, me again, with some quick background info on Shadowboxing. Shadowboxing is a public installation by Toronto artist Abdi Osman that builds on his ongoing research surrounding the gaps between experiences and representations of queer cruising, space, and placemaking in the city. Visible to pedestrians without being in direct sightline, a projection of lush green park environments documented by Osman from sites across the city appears from the upper window of the Archives Building, a heritage home located in what is considered Toronto's gay village. Osmond's holdings and records of queer locational fortitude speak to the countless compounded sites around us where bodies have forged connections in time and space in spite of continued realities of homophobia, racism, and white supremacy that exist in Toronto and beyond. This projection is augmented by an online audio work that features local oral histories about queer cruising from the perspectives and experiences of Black, queer, and trans community members as recorded by the artist. Through the metaphor of shadowboxing as a relational, defensive, and precarious state, this public art installation invites viewers to consider some of the shifting conditions in which queer connection takes place. In this way, shadows offer and represent radical spaces involving environmental and bodily negotiations that are always site-specific. And finally, if you head over to YouTube and look up Shadow Boxing Panel, you'll be able to see Abdi Osman, Joriel, and Christopher Smith in conversation around Abdi's installation, hosted by curator Ellen Walker and the Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. You'll also meet Rooney Green, who, Abdi is just currently telling us right now, will be featured in Abdi's upcoming work. It just closed recently, right? At the archives? Yes, it did. Um, it closed um, on November 2nd. Cool. How was it seeing your work up there? It was, uh, seeing my work there was um, interesting because it was a different space. Mm-hmm. Um, because the, the first iteration of the, the installation was an indoor installation, right. which was happening at the Gatineau Museum. Right. Um, and so the, the type, the, the difference between um, the outdoor projection mm-hmm. and, the, and the inside installations are very interesting. And, but also interesting, but also um, it gave a completely different kind of sense, right? Yeah. Um, I think the outdoor space, because um, when it was at the Gardner Museum, um, because it was an indoor installation, what we did is we tried to recreate um, a park setting 
the reiteration uh, that happened at the at Queens to mm -hmm. shadow boxing was completely opposite because it was projecting from outside. Right. So any passerby would see and, and they could just use a QR code to listen to the audio. Cool. Which made which gave it a, a different sense of basically it's, it it made, it brought it closer to cruising, right? Okay, um cruising um for the queer community is um what I would consider um <laughs> it's very difficult it's, to Yeah, no, it. totally. It's a huge it's, question. Yeah, for it's sure. very difficult to um explain. Um but cruising pretty much is um individuals um going to hook up for sex reasons. Mm -hmm. Um uh, or sometimes it's not even sex reasons, it's more about um voyeurism, right? Yeah. Uh, kinda like you're just interested in seeing other people have sex. From my experiences of hearing about cruising stories mm -hmm. um, from different people, um, and some of them my friends, but then also witnessing some of the cruising happening late at night, right? Yeah. Um, and so what ha what the reason I decided to do the project was um, at first was I could see that cruising was kind of like dying slowly, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time it was also not dying, but it was also being replaced by um, by the apps, right? Right, totally. Um, and so there's, it was, I, it's, to me, it seemed like a generational thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's certain people who are really, like the cruising was basically the app. Yeah. Right? Right, like grinder or scruffer, yeah. For, yeah. And, and for the younger generation, um, the apps are more like, the, they're cruising, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have to kind of check out the, the person mm -hmm. on, on, on the apps and then see if you're interested in them based on like the superficiality yeah, of Yeah, <laughs> their short bio, their yeah. face, totally, totally. Exactly. Yeah. So but but with cruising it was like one to one, right? Yeah. Um one on one. So you look you go around, you make you make the you make the rounds in the in the park. Um, you kind of like lock eyes with somebody who you're interested in yeah. and if the same thing happens and then that's it, right? And it's a lot about the body language too, right? Exactly. Like there's these codes that a passerby might not even notice, but you know, it's like a shift in the shoulders or like a, a look. Exactly. And also because cruising was um, like it has been uh, criminalized for a long time. Yeah. And so I think the body language um, is very important, right? Totally. It's a, a major role, right? In yeah. terms of who can... Who, who you signal to and who can actually read the signals. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. in terms of overly, being overly policed. And, yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's so fascinating. Where, what, did it give you a different sense of the project watching people watch the video outside, like in this kind of cruising space? Like, what did that feel like? Looking at the installation from outside, mm -hmm. um, it actually comes as close as um, cruising in the park. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of people who even who haven't been, who don't didn't know anything about cruising mm -hmm. or who maybe heard about cruising but they didn't really know what was involved mm -hmm. um, would actually get an idea of it, right? And so some of them were very curious and some of them were like interested and intrigued. Yeah, right? totally. um, And so there's different kind of, um, different kind of, um, what do you call, expressions that, or, or like the, the different kind of takes that people are, were taken from the video, right? right. So, uh, like the different readings yeah. of the of the projections and the audio, um, and some thought, um, some people actually thought it was, like, it was conversation that people would have inside, right? Like in private, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but cruising is not really a private space. No, right? it's part uh, of it. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's 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 not it's not a private space. It's very public, mm -hmm. um, and these conversations obviously. Uh, um, uh, iterations of people's ideas of people's actually lived yeah. experiences of cruising, right? Totally. Um, and so, which is very interesting because normally you don't really hear those stories. Mm -hmm. um, those stories seem to be like um, they happen in the park and then they, they stay in there. the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And there's a few historic spots in Toronto, right? That yeah. for cruising, I think Queens Park is one of them. Queens Park is um, one of the major ones. Mm -hmm. um, but then the other ones, so there's Hyde Park, there's Queen's Park, um, there's um, Philosopher's Lane, right. um, uh, the of T. Yeah, right. And then on top of that, sometimes what happens is, like based on what people, the, the conversation, the audio, mm -hmm. um, the way people are explaining to me um, their experiences, sometimes what happens is people would hook up in the park, but then they would move over to, um, to U of T. Yeah. 
Cool. Like right? into like philosopher's lane or yeah, yeah. Because because oh, some parts of your team because those parts were very private. So yeah, um, you um you hook up with somebody in a public space, mm-hmm. but then you find another public space semi private, <laughs> right? It's um, like going to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. I love that. Um, I'm gonna direct people. Are they able to find shadow boxing online? So uh, shadow boxing. Um, now you can only find shadow boxing the audio online. Okay. Um, but not the visual. But what I would suggest for people to do is um, kind of because the the video uh, projection thing were didn't have any sound. Right. And so the sound was kind of like, you know, the audio recording from the individuals. Right. Um, and so what you can do is, as long as you're familiar with Queen's Park or Hyde Park, mm-hmm. try to imagine that you're in that space Ooh. when you're listening to the audio. I really like that. Or even just put it on and walk around if you're able to. Exactly. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I definitely want to do that. One more quick interruption. I just love this idea so much that I asked Abdi's permission to include a little bit of the audio from shadow boxing here so that you can actually experience this for yourself. So if you're watching this video at home, close your eyes as the first bit of the audio plays and walk through a mental park and really imagine yourself in that setting. Or if you're able to, put the audio on in headphones and actually walk through a park. So when I think about places in Toronto where I have cruised and places that I really like that was my favorite spots to go look for cock. I think about um, Cathro Park on Church Street. I think about Cherry Beach. Um, Cathro Park was one of my favorite places to cruise for a dick. I mean, after the clubs were closed, and particularly after the barn was closed, and you know, you were not fortunate enough to pick up somebody at the bar, then you would go to Cathro Square, and for sure you could get your, your dick sucked, or you could suck somebody's dick, or you could fuck somebody's ass, or somebody could fuck your ass. I mean, you had a, a choice of, you know, of whatever. You know, it used, I had so much fun at Cathro Park, fucking a nice ass, sucking a nice dick, or having my dick sucked. I mean, in Cherry Beach during the day when, you know, it's summertime and the sun is hot, you go to Cherry Beach and, you know, men will be laying out there all naked, waiting for dick, you know, always to get their cock sucked or their cock played with. I mean, many a times I would go to Cherry Beach in the summer, roll a blade, and man, the man would just be there, no inhibitions, just waiting to have some, you know, some good sex. I love these two places because it, it was so much fun Remember, if you want the full audio of shadow boxing, head to the link in the episode notes. Now, while you were doing some mental cruising, Abdi and I were discussing the precarity of cruising spots in the city. Let's get back to it. Because um, surveillance, different people get surveilled differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason most of the Toronto parks are actually going through, are being gentrified and kind yeah. of like cleaned out, yeah. is not, um, not only to get rid of the homeless who sleep there, mm-hmm. but it's also to get rid of is cruising spots, right? Yeah. Um, because um, the more the more the city is gentrified and people moving from elsewhere, mm-hmm. they find um, they find that as a nuisance, mm-hmm. and because of um, of what I consider to be um, respectability yes, politics, yes, right? Totally. Um, and so a lot of the people, even um, and this also has something to, it's not only it's not non queer people only mm-hmm. it's also queer people right mm-hmm. uh, queer people from a particular kind of like um starters or class yeah who also feel like this is beneath them and yeah. should not be like you're you know, like yeah. white rich gay man exactly. who works for like td or yeah. something <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to throw an example out there yeah no totally and it's like and then there's um i think there's a drive for for people to like line up with the politics of respectability and then say like that's not me i'm queer but that's not my kind of queerness right and like set this distance exactly and and the kind of shaming of sudden uh, um practices totally yeah what about future projects do you have anything that you can talk about or actually uh, at this point i've been during covid i've just been doing a lot of drawings mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which You're i beautiful. call um covid drawings so and these are paintings that i'm doing as well um, so the covid drawings um i started doing those because most of my work involves um, people mm. um, and because I couldn't I couldn't hang out with people I couldn't meet with people in person because of the pandemic yeah uh, so I switched my um, 
my practice um, and went back to things that I used to do before. Mm. Um, because I think as an artist, you always have to evolve, right? Uh, okay. You can't just be stuck in one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't consider myself to be, I don't call myself a photographer yeah, right. or video art person. I call myself a multidisciplinary. Because, don't put me in a box. Yeah, yeah totally. because I feel like um, at times I want to draw, at times I want to paint, mm -hmm. at times I just want to do photography, and mm -hmm. there are the times that I just want to do audio and yeah. not even photography and not video. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the different elements of art that, um, that people can take from my work, um, and my work is very um, accessible as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's why whenever I have an exhibition, like a photographic exhibition, I like to um, juxtapose that work with, uh, with a video so that oh. People who might not really because you can look at an image and look at the image and say, okay, so this is a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. But I like to also, um, I also like to document the behind the scenes of what's happening, right? So mm -hmm. it gives the images a different layer. Absolutely, and yeah. I think there's such a two dimensionality that we're all really used to, especially with social media. Like you see something, and literally what you see is what you get. What I you think, get. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just most of my work is created based on. Not only my lived experience, but also people who, like I, people who I, I know mm -hmm. or um of, I know of them, um, but also not only knowing of them, but also have this kind of relationships, right? Um, totally. And so I want to document certain aspects of um black people, um whether it's through whether it's have something to do with race mm -hmm. or class mm -hmm. or gender um and sexuality, but also um in terms of diasporic movement. Um, and so those are the things I'm interested in. So when I talk about documenting black queers, I'm also thinking about uh, as the intersect, like black masculinity as intersects with Muslim and queer identities. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested in that because um, I'm black, right? But I'm also Muslim, mm -hmm. right? And I'm also queer, right? So how, <laughs> so a lot of people don't really can really associate those three things. Yeah. Um, and so in my work, I try to document other people who are similar to myself, mm -hmm. um, who also have the same kind of experiences and try to bring the experiences um, to like a, almost like a global or local, um, local community, right? I love that. Um, and so for me, the documenting is, it's almost like archival work mm -hmm. uh, because I know um, a lot of people like to talk about things, but then um, they feel like, okay, so I'm going to do a documentation of this, or I'm going to photograph, or I'm going to make a video, and that's the end of it. Yeah, um, totally. Um, for me, it's an ongoing process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you will see, sometimes you'll see repetitions of the same people in my work. Oh, cool. Um, and the reason you see that is also because I've worked, I have formed kind of relationships, long-term relationships with these people. Mm -hmm. It's not just, I just didn't meet them yesterday and then decided to photograph them. And then you leave. Um, <laughs> because I also, I also see um, the benefits of doing that. Yeah. Uh, because you also have to make people comfortable, um, people relax, people get to know you more, right? Mm -hmm. Totally, there's um, a trust there, right? And, and then there's trust, yeah. yeah. But also, you also, pe also people like to view themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, the way they would like the world to view them, right? Um, totally. And so um, what happens, you don't just photograph or document people and then just go and show the work without any feedback mm -hmm. from those same people, right? Which happens far too often, <laughs> in my opinion, yeah. And I find when you do the, when you, when you uh, engage in that kind of practice, um, your work is not very sustainable mm -hmm. because um, obviously people, people talk, Right, <laughs> and they're like, okay. So if you took a photo of me or, or you interviewed me for something, and then all of a sudden I see it somewhere and you haven't seen that work before, yeah, um, I get, I can get really pissed off because maybe that's not how I wanted to see myself Absolutely. in public, right? Absolutely. Um, but so the involvement is usually it's um, engaging with the individual that um, I work with, mm -hmm. um, show them some of the work. Um, before it goes to an exhibition and make decisions together to see what they feel comfortable being shown and what they don't feel comfortable being shown. Yeah. Because sometimes an artist might feel comfortable showing something, but that is not the same as the person they photograph. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. And so I think coming to this balance is very important for me. And that's why I think um, as an artist, you have to keep that in mind mm -hmm. um, constantly. 
and not just think about what you like because the work is not really about you. Yes, <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Um, yeah. And and so I think I think that's the most important advice that I could give to like an artist mm-hmm. um, is build relationships, confidence, like um, trust with uh, people that you you're, you're working with. Yeah. Um, and and what happens in that case um, when you have that kind of relationship? Also, you end up not having to work too hard to find people because the same people that you work with are also going to give you refer to other people, friends Absolutely. of theirs. And that's why sometimes the people who have never been met are meeting them for like the first or second time. Mm-hmm. And they're interested in the in participating in the project. It's not because of my relationship with them, because I've just met them once or twice. Yeah. But it's their relationship with people who they've known longer who've worked with me. Yeah, totally. You're a trusted figure and they feel yeah. like they can come to you and you represent like you will represent them the way that they would like to be represented. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah, our representations are so precious and it's so easy, I think, especially again with social media, to forget that and like mm-hmm. how much our image is just kind of circulated online. But there's such a powerful politic to that, especially with identity and like it, it needs to be handled correctly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And with respect. So I love that. Um, I'm also really interested in how your work is driven by exploring um, the realities of black and Muslim and queer and the intersections of that. And those are your identities as well. But it's also like you're saying, you know, the work isn't about you. So how have you ever been curious to to put kind of autobiographical narrative into the work you're doing? Um, and so um, I think if you go back to the early work that I did, um, this this uh, self-portrait. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and so sometimes I put myself as a subject yeah. in the work um, to just kind of like run through an idea um, that cool. kind of it does not only affect me but it also affects a lot of other people right um, and so if you look at the series um, discover series mm. um, of the the triptychs of myself um, and others as well and so that work you see um, like you people can read them different ways right yeah um, and so even now even though the work I, that work I did in 2007 mm-hmm. it's still relevant to today right totally because um, because of the surveillance um, who do people assume or think when they think of a Muslim man mm-hmm. right um, and what is man right yeah but also what is Muslim because um, the narration um, the narrative that we always get here um, in North America or in the West, mm-hmm. every time people talk about Muslims, they always talk about the brown Muslim, mm-hmm. right? It rarely do you hear any black Muslims, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's the black Muslim who gets um, a major backlash, right? So mm-hmm. you get um, not only Islamophobia or homophobia, but you also get um, Islamophobia, homophobia, but you also get the anti-blackness, mm-hmm. right? On top of that, right? So there's like different layers yeah. of um, of things that happen to a black body, right? Mm-hmm. Who's Muslim, queer, right? And the um, assumption to it of, of when people think of Islam, they think of it as um, anti-queer and oppressive towards so many of those identities, right? And like oppressive to women, and that's just not the case. <laughs> and that's just not the case, yeah. right? And because people, um, and that's why when I said um, most of the time when people talk about Muslims, they always talk about brown Muslims, right? Yeah. And everything that the brown Muslim community does, or even sometimes has nothing to do with religion, it's more about culture, right? right? Yeah. And so I think people conf- conf- um, conflate um, culture and and religion, right? Absolutely, um, yeah. And so they can't really separate the two, right? Because I can also say the same thing about Christianity, mm-hmm. but I don't really go and say about that Christian because I know there's the, the, a lot of people who are Christian, but they also have... Uh, they come from different cultures, yeah, um, totally. and their cultural differences are very different based on where they come from or who they are, right? Absolutely. Um, and so just because they're Christian, I'm not going to conflate the two and say, okay, so um, your culture is doing this, so because you're Christian, all Christians are doing that. Literally, like when you see like an attack from a white person who's a Christian, the media isn't like another Christian extremist attack. It's like that person gets a name, that person gets a backstory. Like it's just, exactly. yeah, yeah, totally. So um, I think those are the kind of um, subjects and topics that I try to deal deal with in my work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're very, they can be local, but they're also universal. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. What is something that you hope to bring to the lab or achieve through working through the lab with the Queer Trans Research Lab? 
it's not more about what I want to achieve, but by working in the queer and trans lab, mm-hmm. I think it's just um, the idea of kind of like getting to know other people who are working on different kind of, they might be similar subjects or similar kind of theme, right. um, but very different from yours. And you also get to learn a little bit of uh, some things that you didn't know. Um, mm-hmm. And they also get to learn from you. So you learn from each other, right? Yeah, and that's that. what I think um, when I think about the, the collaborators and people who are all in the lab, mm-hmm. um, even though they're working in different projects, but I think the, the project kind of intersect in different kind of ways. Totally. Um, which for me is the most important part, right? And interesting part. I love that. And it becomes like one big project with all these different little aspects to yes. it, right? Um, I have to say too, this is totally off topic, but mm-hmm. like I've, I've known of your work for a while and when I was like a baby queer, <laughs> my visual study was so inspired by the stuff you were doing and how it spoke to um, narratives of structural inequality and also highlighted people in our community and like it's just I don't know I'm just like fan girling over here <laughs> that I'm even sitting here so thank you so much for doing this um, I remember specifically it was your Labib mm-hmm. I believe it was yeah, yeah can you do you mind just speaking a little bit about that because I know it's been a few years yeah um, um so Labib um what actually because before Labib I was actually working on another project mm-hmm. um and so I decided I was going to put that project on pause because it was taking too long. And this also goes back towards um, like forging relationships. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I decided, you know what? I'm from Somalia. Um, there are all these queer people in Soma- Somali queer people who I know in Toronto. Um, nobody really talks about them. Right? Yeah. Um, and in terms of, and more, more so even trans people. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, you hear about trans people, we see them, obviously, because we know them, we're mm-hmm. friends with them, but then nobody really talks about them in terms of them existing even, right? Totally. Um, and so with Labib, um, what prompted me to do that project is because I was thinking about the word itself, um, and I'm thinking, okay, so this word is not really English, mm-hmm. um, it's very Somali, right? Mm-hmm. But also, the word also means transsexual or transgender. Right. Or trans transsexual, transgender, transvestite, mm-hmm. right? Those are the yeah the terms that the, the word um, labib means, mm-hmm. right? Or stands for. But so hearing that, and I'm thinking, okay, so if this word already existed, yeah. so this is not a new phenomenon, right? Right. Um, so why is it that all of a sudden people feel like... It's a trend or it's, it's a, a trend yeah, totally. or it's something that yeah. just happened, right? Because yeah. people are here. Um, and so I tried to go through that approach and try to, f- and that's why I ended up actually naming the the series Labib. I love that. And and also thinking about my Somaliness and um, the late Somali and Somaliness, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to put the thing together. And that's why I had also, I would, um, there's some images of her just like, you know, I'm like, you could be Western, you could dress in a Western outfit, but you can also dress in a traditional outfit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we think about clothing, for me, clothing is just drag. Like every day yeah. we, we yeah. wear something that sometimes we're not even wearing for ourselves, we're wearing for what other people would think of us. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I said, okay, so if you have um, somebody dressed in different kind of ways, why do we, why are we always stuck there, mm-hmm. right? In terms of dress. Totally. Right? Because the dress does not really reflect who the person is, mm-hmm. right? Um, sometimes it's just an expression. Yeah, and it can change. It and doesn't it can mean change. that you're that person yeah. forever, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and so um and and that's why I decided to do also a vid. So I had like different um different images of Somalia mm-hmm. um in different traditional outfits, yeah. right? But also in very kind of contemporary Western outfit. Mm-hmm. But I'm also thinking even the word contemporary too. Contemporary, like when we talk about Western, we think of contemporary, but there's also Somali contemporary, right? Right. Um, so. If you look at Somali vintage photographs, mm-hmm. the kind of dress dressing has kind of changed drastically, right? right? Um, and sometimes when I look at vintage photographs, I think also as, oh my God, this is, this is even this should be now and not <laughs> back then, right? Yeah, totally. Uh, and so the the evolution of even um, outfits mm-hmm. has kind of changed in different cultures, right? It's not the same. So just because you're wearing something doesn't mean it's not contemporary. So it could be contemporary. It might not be contemporary to the Western person, but it's contemporary to the person who's living there. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, and and the other reason also I, I ended up 
having that little clip mm -hmm. of uh, the video, um, the, the diptych of Sumaya was also to prove that point, right? So to mm -hmm. like reinsert her into the culture as well, right? Because it seems like people remove queer and trans people from the culture, but I'm reinserting them because I'm also using the title of what actually means to be trans, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you for that. I'm so glad that I asked you. <laughs> Well, that brings us to the end of episode two of the QT cast at the studio with Abdi Osman. Make sure to check out Abdi's work online. And remember, you can still listen to the full audio from Shadowboxing if you just follow the link in the episode notes. If you want to get in touch with us at the QT cast, email qtcast21 at gmail.com or follow us at qtcast underscore. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about the QTRL, you can check out our page on the Bottom Center's website. You can find that link in the episode notes as well. Thank you so much for tuning in and supporting the show. Until next time, folks. Okay, so what inspires me is um, like ordinary things, yeah. right? Everyday ordinary things that happen in life, right? Um, whether it's through my lens or through the lens of others. Mm -hmm. um, and just seeing that is what kind of pushes me to do the kind of work that I do. Cool. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for this.